Hi everyone, hi everyone, and welcome to the first PR Roundtable of 2021. Before we start and I introduce you to the guests, I want to make sure everyone is connected and has found their way to the chat. So if you haven't found the chat, go to presley.com slash live, log on to the chat and let me know where you're joining from and also what you're wishing for in 2021. I'm really curious. I know it's a little bit cheesy, but yeah, you see, we still have our Christmas tree around, so I'm still feeling a little bit festive. So I'm curious to see where you guys are all calling in from and what you are wishing for 2021. So in today's episode, we're going to be talking all about strategy. So much of the time, a PR strategy is a lot like a New Year's resolution. You write it out at the start of a project with all the best intentions of the world and then never look at it again which isn't really helpful to anybody. So today we're going to find out how to make a strategy that will actually work for you, how to set measurable goals and how to communicate both of those things to your clients. And to help, we have our two expert guests, the creme de la creme of the comms industry here with me from both sides of the Atlantic. So here we have the masterminds behind Spin Sucks, Ginny Dietrich and Laura Sutherland from PR Fest and Aura PR. Welcome to the show. How are you both today? Okay, thanks. How are you? I am good. How are you, Ginny? I'm great, and I'm so excited to be here with Laura because oh. we've been friends online forever, and now <laughs> we finally. Yeah, that's basically like uh, my first question. But maybe before we dive in, we already see people logging in from Wisconsin. We've got uh, from Zurich. We've got from Durham, Dallas, Texas, Germany, uh, Belgium, Guernsey, G Zurich again, Orlando. Ooh, it's good. No wishes. <laughs> anything for 2021. Uh -huh. <laughs> so maybe everyone. <laughs> <Right>. <laughs> so, uh, okay, the end cool. of 2020, <laughs> please. Yeah, exactly. exactly. Yeah. So, but both of you are really well known uh, for creating your own PR communities as well as your data-driven approach to communications from strategy to measurement to content creations. But I'm curious, have you guys ever worked together before, Jeannie? No, we have not. <laughs> <laughs> this but is the you first time we've physically spoken. <laughs> it is. And, and when Kate told me that it was going to be Laura, I was like, yes, woohoo! So, <laughs> thank you. <laughs> Thanks for having <laughs> us. <laughs> Yeah, that's good. It's great that we can be the matchmakers these You're days. The matchmaker. so that's like we did our first good deed of the year and it's just <laughs> January. <laughs> so that's good. But both of you have been really focused and fixed, fixated on, on data and strategy. And, and why is that? And let's start with you, Laura. What, what's the fixation on, on strategy and data, which makes it such an important thing of, of what you do? Um, I, when I first started out in PR 20 years ago, we didn't really have very much data. Um, there wasn't a huge amount at your fingertips. And with all the platforms that we have now, um, with all the, the data that we have, they're readily available to anybody that, that has a channel or software um, that knows anything about wanting to know about audiences. You have so much information available at your fingertips. and you know, I think that, um, you know, we talk about strategy, but I still think that a lot of people think tactically before they think strategically. Yep. And, and I think that with, with strategy, it has to be informed by something. It's not a finger in the wind approach. Um, mm -hmm. And with data, you have data which then supports your rationale for your strategy and how you can achieve your goals. Okay, Jeannie, what, do you think the same there or do you have like some more nuance? No, I, I do. I think exactly the same, which is why I like her. Um, <laughs> <laughs> but I also, I, and I also think there's an opportunity here for us to have a real leadership stake at the table where we can demonstrate results where to Laura's point 20 years ago we had media impressions and advertising equivalencies which mm -hmm. are bunk they're not real real metrics um but that's what we had and as things have evolved and as the internet has provided us provided us the opportunity to really pay attention to data it's given us a huge opportunity to measure our the work that we do to something that matters to the organization 
Yeah. yeah. And is this, is this the biggest change that you've kind of seen? Like if you look at yourself, like, I don't know, like five years ago to today, um, um, is, is that kind of like the biggest opportunity that actually is, is still growing for PR and comps professionals, G? <laughs> so much has changed. <laughs> um, yeah. I, I mean, I have been in the industry for 20 years and in the beginning we were doing things like cookbooks, you know, we would stand at the copier and make copies of the, the, the articles where our clients had been featured and we make these huge cookbooks and, you know, I mean, obviously all that has changed, right? You guys mm -hmm. have provided an opportunity for that to change as well. The, the social media has changed. Content marketing has changed. The fact that we can do social media advertising and native advertising and sponsored content, all of that has changed. So there's, there's been this huge opportunity for us to really look at, we don't just do media relations and events and reputation management anymore. There's so much mm -hmm. more to it. Yeah. And, but do you feel that the clients that you speak to, uh, Laura, do they, do they fancy making a big strategic deck or are people, because I, we hear sometimes for customers like, like strategy, like why do we need to do? Let's just get into it. Like, but why is there sometimes a little bit of a hesitance to kind of work on strategy because they think it's going to be big decks and boring stuff? Um, how do you approach that people who, who come to you with, with this kind of like 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 mentality? Um, quite simply, I don't work with people that don't do strategy. <laughs> um, <laughs> <laughs> yes. um, yeah, it's it's. I think so so part of the conversation we've been having or I've been having with people in the last few years has been that there are a number of agencies and in-house departments who will be happy to tactfully um, or tactically um, walk away from a conversation and just go and start delivering on the outputs whereas there's never the question of why like why are we doing something what objective are we supporting with um, with this, uh, you know, activity, um, there's 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 little sort of rationale or thinking behind it. And in fact, I was speaking to one of my mentees um, earlier on this morning, who she was saying one of her dilemmas is um, her line manager um, and challenging him for the why. Um, so rather than just going away and doing something and executing, she's kind of saying, "Well, why are we doing that? What's the point to that?" And I think there's a resistance. Um, commercially from um, maybe agencies who um, are worried that they will put clients off and they just want to go and deliver what the client wants. So if the client says to them, um, I want media coverage on my product or my service, an agency will go and take that brief and they will go and deliver that media coverage. But what they don't do is scrutinize the brief to the extent where they're questioning why what are you trying to achieve why what are your business goals behind this what is the what are, what's you know what's the purpose what's the value and mm -hmm. once you start to drill down into that information that's where the, the gold dust and that's where the nuggets are that's where you know i like working um but there are there are companies that are happy just to go and execute and i think that's where the problem lies that we're not all singing from the same hymn sheet mm -hmm. um However, having said that, I do believe there there is room for people that think just tactfully because they're never going to be at that strategic level. And there's room for the strategic thinkers who aren't necessarily going to deliver on the tactics. But the, the, the main point I would say is the integration of all that and how that comes back to the business, the business objectives, the, the purpose of the business, and then how that's going to support um, going forward. Yeah, makes sense. And uh, Jeannie, of course, you've kind of came up with a very famous uh, Bezo model. But w what are actually elements that make up any great strategy? Is this is this like you start from that model and kind of build up, or is it really dependent on on what the brief is? You, um, well, certainly, it depends on the brief, right? But mm -hmm. you you have to start with research, and you have to figure out what it is that you're trying to achieve. What are the goals? What are you? What what is it that you're trying to achieve? And the research is internal, it's external, it's talking to key stakeholders, employees, customers, even people, uh, what's the word I want? I was going to use the word trolls, but that's not the right word. People who are not fans of yours um, or of the, the companies, it's talking to everybody. It's getting that kind of research and it doesn't necessarily have to be this huge, you know, multi 
thousands of dollars um, research. You can do easy things. Like we have one client who three years ago were trying to figure out how to, to where to spend their time online. And so they sent a survey monkey and they just said, you know, when you when you're on social media, what which social networks do you participate in? And then they broke it down personally and professionally. And it was really easy to get that kind of information. So you want to start with research first and then figure out, OK, where does the peso model fit and what what kinds of things do I do? So you wouldn't necessarily launch with we're going to do everything. We're going to do paid or uh, shared and owned. We might start with owned and then go to shared and then go to earned and then go to paid. So there's a lot lots of different things that go into it. But I think to Laura's point that if you can start with the if you should start with the, the strategy and the goals, what are we trying to achieve? How does the research support that? And then figure out what where the PESO model fits in. Yeah. And what what are the, the questions that you want to have answered it during that research? Um, um, maybe you can chime in there, Laura. What are the stuff that you really want to make sure that you check this before kind of moving on to the, the actual strategy in, in that initial research phase? So one of the, one of the biggest things that um, or the, one of the biggest challenges we have um, kind of taking this slightly wider is demonstrating the value of public relations. And we've yes. talked about that. <laughs> yes. talked about a lot, yeah. um, and, and part of that problem is that we're not properly measuring and evaluating. Um, and if you look at AMEC, um, the International Association for Measurement and Evaluation of Communications, for anyone that doesn't know it, <laughs> um, they, they have put together an integrated framework. Now, Nothing like this is ever going to be perfect because things obviously ebb and flow and every business and organisation is different. But the main principle is, is that measurement evaluation starts at the very beginning. So to what Ginny was saying um, a short time ago, you do your research first, but you don't just do your research to find out for informing the strategy. You do your research to allow you to benchmark as well. Mm -hmm. so if yes, you, that's a great point. Yes. Yeah. So you, you, I think, and I think that's what people forget. Again, conversation I was having with a mentee this morning, she was talking about um, not actually being asked for any sort of value or presentation of what she's achieved, other than here is here is press cuttings. And I said, how are, how are you then going to you know move forward and move up to manager to director level if you can't demonstrate the value of what you're doing and you can't discuss that either? You need to be thinking more about the impact of what you're doing. And the analogy I gave was very simple. Say you're, you know, you're set with a behavior change of getting some, you know, a community to eat more fruit. You go and ask them the question, you know, how much fruit do you eat a day? Where do you buy your fruit from? What fruit exactly do you eat? And you do that at the at the beginning. So you find out where what you're dealing with. You've then got your objectives that you set afterwards. So you know what you're going to increase it by. You right. know what your goals right. are. Right. You then develop the strategy, you then have the tactical plan, but you then go back at the end and you do the same research so you can yes. find out what fruit to eat now, how that has changed <laughs> and, and the behavior change. And that is where the whole value, the measurement and evaluation um, and the whole thing comes together, I, I, I think. And I think people overcomplicate it. They worry about the whole strategy thing, as you were saying, Ginny, about you know the cost and the time. Um, they go into tactics because they think they just need to deliver and get some quick wins. But actually, if you think about the process of what we do and the start and the end point, and that might be a continual thing, mm -hmm. but there has to be milestones where people are doing that. And I think that is absolutely crucial to what we as practitioners and what we're teaching the, the next generation as well. There's a it's it's interesting that you say that because there's I think there's a I always say that PR has done a, a terrible job of its own PR. Um, but I don't know about you, but I still get phone calls from prospects saying we just we want PR. And I have to say, I just had this conversation with somebody. I said, well, what do you mean by that? And she said, well, we, we really just we're trying to get into the U.S. market and we really just want top tier media. And I said, OK, well, that's not what we do. Um, and I talked through, you know, how we approach things and how we approach things, Laura, to your point, exactly, you know, strategically and with research and, you know, all of that that's 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 based in the kinds of things that they want to achieve. And she goes, yeah, we just want PR. And I was like, oh, my gosh. OK, we're not the right firm for you then. Um, but there's 
there's this huge issue I think that we face as an industry that that's all we do. And try as I might, and I have tried mm -hmm. to change that perception, it's just, it's still there, unfortunately. But, but isn't the reason why, why people just want like to talk with journalists, isn't the reason that is that because there are still practitioners that are doing exactly that? For sure, yeah. for sure. And, yeah, yeah. and how do we fix that? How do we fix that? How do we fix the do better PR, SPR? I think it's generational. I think it's, fair. I think that's fair. I think that we, we have, we've, we have, we have moved in the last 10 years. We have moved not at the speed we maybe want to, mm -hmm. but we have moved forward. We started to integrate. We started to understand. We, we've even moved into, you know, we were talking about the changes like um, artificial intelligence and um, augmented reality. We started to change and go wider than media relations. But until the leaders of organizations, teams, Correct. businesses are, are instilling with it in, the, in that culture of the team, you know, go and uh, you know, upskill, go and adapt, go and learn, and go and branch out into other areas and bring back into PR what you loved. That's when you start to see more of the sort of diversity of skills, diversity of thinking as well. And that is absolutely crucial because we we are we're there as you know problem solvers essentially to businesses as well i firmly believe um mm -hmm. and if we're going to solve problems then we have to be able to be resilient we have to understand um you know the challenges that people are facing and we have to have the, the teams and the skills and the people or the networks or however we work mm -hmm. that are to do that mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. yeah makes sense but uh, when I listen to kind of both of your podcasts and, and you're talking about uh, like strategy, I, I'm always kind of thinking this is not just for PR. This is much broader. This is just like how you need to act as an organization. How you need to, <laughs> and, 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 and do you kind of see that as kind of like, are you aware of that? Are you kind of making your customers aware of it? Also, when, for example, you speak with the stakeholders at your clients, do you generally still come into the PR departments or is it is it really dependent? Do you see like an evolution there, Ginny? Yeah, that's an interesting question. I have to think about this for a minute. I don't think we report to a single PR department for any of our clients. Okay. Um, marketing directly to the leadership team. Yeah, I know. I, I hate that some clients we do report into marketing, but the nature and, of the beast but, but, but yeah but how, i don't think any how do you then identify with pr as uh, like a, 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 a professional yourself like how do you see pr or communication or, or the area that you're in is it all blended do you still feel more like what's the difference between a marketing agency for example the way i see it and i know that there are people who agree with this, but this is the way I see it. I see that communications is re responsible for the relationships. So the mm -hmm. relationships with employees, the relationship with customers, the relationship with prospects, the relationship with the community, whatever it happens to be, they we are responsible for the relationship. Marketing is, rela is responsible for branding and for product development and those kinds of things. And advertising is responsible for selling. Um, are there things we, we do that overlap? For sure. And do we need to break down the silos so that we all work together? Yes. But I don't think that, I still think there's an opportunity for us each to have a sandbox to play in without saying, oh, well, PR no longer exists or PR is dead. That's not the case at all. We are responsible for the relationship. Yeah. And this, so this means that like for, for you, it's kind of fine that, internal communication is part of your strategy that you're proposing absolutely yes yeah you have to communicate with everybody yeah yeah make that that makes it a lot a lot, lot of sense for me and, and uh, um laura how, how do you feel about what Jeannie just said <laughs> i mean it's like it's like we've been broken from the <laughs> it's over the pond from each other um yeah, they were like put one here and one here <laughs> It's, it's so true though we we are there to look after yeah. relationships do you know why because we're there to build trust we're there to build trust because we want to keep employees we want to keep stakeholders on board we want to keep um, investors on board we want to keep the media on board we want to keep the staff we want to attract new staff that's why we need to build the relationships and we need to build the trust 
We also want the customers to continue to buy from us. Oh, hiya. Yeah. <laughs> we need to keep the customers coming and buying from us. So from that point of view, we need the customers to love us and they need to be brand advocates. They need to be loyal to the brand at the same time. And I think, you know, when when people talk about um, the, the sort of marketing department, the, the PR department, the PR department generally will be a press office function. It won't be a true PR department. Um, there's a um, an, another person I always blow the trumpet for um, over in um, in London um, is uh, Jim Hawker, who has an agency called Three Pipe, um, and Three Pipe was one of the first agencies to completely like remodel itself, um, flatten it, and work to the piso model, so that they would have teams that were actually made up of skilled people rather than hierarchical. So they just flattened that whole hierarchy and then brought in the skills as and when needed for, for the team, rather than, um, you know, the account director will lead on this and the account manager will do this and the account exec will just go and execute everything. Um, and I think that people need to stop thinking in the traditional way of how teams were built and how agencies were built and how models um, survive essentially, because it's the new models of agencies that are coming in that are thriving at the moment. Um, it's you know it's 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 how we all integrate that's going to make it work essentially, um, and I don't think we've got that right yet, and I don't think we have enough leaders in the industry that are pushing for us to be that way either. Okay, good. I think there's someone else who wants to talk strategy over there, Jeannie. <laughs> <laughs> Hi. 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 All right, go back. Hey. 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 Oh, the beauties of uh, looking for Hi, yeah, yeah. No it. dogs barking like uh, <laughs> it's fine. It's so fine. So, so like, if we bring it back to strategy uh, a little bit, the thing you hear like again and again is that they, everyone like goes into like a new project with a kind of nicely built out strategy, but how do you keep up? How do you keep checking that you're on track, how do you make keep that, 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 that strategy current, look at it again, rework it again? Ginny, is there, is there a technique that you use there to, to make sure that people actually follow the strategy and it's not something that's is collecting dust somewhere in the Google Drive? It's a really, really, really great point because you're right, it does tend to collect dust in the, it used to be it would collect dust in the, the bookshelf above your desk, but now it collects shelf in the Google Drive. Um, so there are a couple of things that we do. Number one, we create the plan and then we drill it down into a two page document that can actually sit on your desk. And then from there, we create a one page slide and the one page slide is in everything that we do. So when we have when we have weekly meetings, when we have you know monthly check ins, when we have quarterly results reporting, that one slide is in the document that we present and it, it everything that we do goes back to that. So you'll have your, your strategy across the top, you'll have your goals across the side, and then you'll talk about all the things that you do in there. And it's been really interesting to present, to do it that way, because what happens is clients will say, well, let's do this. And you can say, great, where does it fit in here? And if it doesn't, yeah. is it a priority? Is it something that we need to shift? Or is it just something that we'd like to have and we don't really need? And so if I'm correct, this is something you kind of make before before you, the project actually starts. You get correct. kind of buy-in from the customer on, on that specific part. And yep. then you kind, of, kind of you use it in your advantage to kind of like, listen, we agreed upon this. Like, how is this fitting in? And, and that yeah. kind of helps you yeah. Yeah. To, to make sure that the client actually doesn't derail the project himself. Sure, or that we don't. I'm I I tend to derail things sometimes because I get excited. I'm like, oh look, let's go do TikTok. Yeah. <laughs> Ooh, what's that nice, nice, nice tiny new thing? <laughs> oh, there's a new social network. Let's see. <laughs> right. We've also so, got uh, tools, which is good. Um, so you know, after you've obviously developed the strategy, hopefully it's a one a one pager. Um, I quite often maybe develop something more like a manifesto. Um, so that again, you can always refer back to it. So it's you know what the purpose is, what you can expect to, you know, work with, or or what you're trying to achieve, um, and you can always come back to it, like Jenny was saying. But equally, after that, when you've developed your, you've got your strategy, you have to develop your tactical plan. Once you develop your plan, that's really what you need to be sticking to, so that you're on time, you're on budget, 
so that you're constantly moving. Um, and if you look at the likes of Trello, that's a really good tool to, for you to be able to keep control of your timings, um, your actions, how things are moving along, why things are maybe sticking, um, assigning tasks to teammates, etc. So it's important that we, we, we think about tools in a way that makes our job easier, um, quicker, hopefully as well, more effective um, and less room for error. But at the same time, um, you know, that's relating back to the strategy and your objectives. So that should be keeping you on track, essentially. Yeah, yeah. Like, Jeannie, you, you've mentioned, and I've heard you say that on your podcast, that, that you should kind of, when presenting that strategy, that you never really promise kind of specific results. Often the customer comes to you, we want to have coverage there or this or that. But but how do you manage expectations then? How do you deal with these specific like demands that are coming in um, with regards to measurement? There, there are a couple of things that we do. I mean, certainly everything that we've talked about to this point in terms of research and strategic thinking and all those kinds of things help. Um, we also benchmark. So we'll look at things and say, okay, in the past, you've done this, this, and this. And so let's look at how we, how the work that we do together might affect those goals. Your goal is to do this. Let's look at how we might be able to affect the goal from the work that we do together. Um, and one of the things I personally love to do, mostly because I just like to prove my own point, is I'll say to a client, you want to be in the New York Times? All right, let's do it. So we get we will get a story. We'll work on a story. It takes forever because the New York Times doesn't just publish something. Reuters, that's another good example. They don't just publish stuff because you want something published. They you have to go through the process, right? And it takes forever. And in the meantime, we're going to we're doing other things. We're we're implementing a PESO model program. We're doing content. We're doing social media. We're doing some paid social and those kinds of things. And we're seeing results from that. On the flip side, the one goal that the CEO had, which was to get in the New York Times, we still haven't gotten there. We're still working on it. And then when it happens, you can always tell whether or not that's been effective. Sure, he's on the golf course and his buddies are like, saw you in the New York Times. That was a great article. Great. What does that do for sales? How does that affect our, our bottom line? How does that affect, affect our goals? And so you get them, you sort it's, it's a painful process, but you get them to the point where they go, you're right. I don't need to be in the New York times. I mean, it was great that my buddies thought it was awesome, but that didn't do anything for us. And so you, <clears throat> I'm going to say this out loud, but you almost make it think it, make them think it's their own idea to stop with those kinds of crazy demands because it doesn't affect the business. Yeah. Yeah, and th that's that makes a lot of sense. Is that kind of you bring them into what they actually want, but at the same time you you teach them what they actually need, right? Yeah. So there's yeah. kind of a, a kind of a nice difference uh, yeah. in in that. Um, like, but but what are because you talked about it briefly about what, what are then benchmarks that you kind of use mm -hmm. uh, or kind of like refer to that really make the difference? Maybe Laura, you can kind of go in there. What are stuff that you like to kind of use? Um, to 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 tell to your clients or, or the the, the C-suite of your clients to kind of like make sure, but we are going to make a difference. We believe that this will make a difference. What are kind of benchmarks that you like to put in place there? That's a really difficult question because it will vary probably for every client. Well, it will because every client has different objectives, um, and you will set different benchmarks or you will have different data or you'll be asking different questions. Um, and I think that's one of the main points uh, probably to make is that there is no one size that fits all. Um, and you have to think, you have to understand strategy and measurement and evaluation before you can go in and speak to a client and start promising them value, um, real value, because until you can demonstrate that value on either the bottom line or um, with a, a change in behavior or, or change in perceptions or whatever the goal is, you're you're not going to be able to do that because if you just talk tactics, you can't you can't measure that performance. Um, yeah, and that, that and that's essentially what it's about and where you know we do such a bad job of our own PR because those that yeah. carry on doing that are basically um, giving us a negative um, you know I, I get called into um, you know and I'm an, an, an independent consultant so I work by myself 
that I get called in to save clients from large agencies who have promised the world because they've sent sure. in a director to give all the chat. Sure. Um, and then, you know, I have to come in and say, I'm sorry, but that I, I, that can't be guaranteed. Um, that's not how it's done. Um, I'm sorry for your experience, but I'm then having to reverse the impression someone's mm -hmm. given somebody about right. what work relations is and does. Right. Um, and that's why these these conversations are so, so important because the more we can have these conversations with our own industry colleagues, the more hopefully that people will start to understand the, the importance of what we're saying. Um, and the more role models we have that, that actually set that bar, set that standard, the more people will follow. And I think, to be fair, I think that the, the, the next generation of practitioners coming in are hungry for purpose and are hungry for impact um, and they're you know they're very clever and astute as well and I think that's important that we really harness that mm -hmm. yeah and really that, yeah go ahead Jeannie Sorry. There, so, that's the second time you've mentioned that and it it reminds me of as as we were building the peso model certification and helping the industry understand that there's more that we can do in terms of measuring the results that we do in, into something that, that matters to an organization, we went to the industry first. We went to professionals first. And we had some, you know, some people took the certification. Some people went through. We worked with PRSA here in the States to, to do some of that. But it didn't grab on the way that we thought, thought it would. And at the same time, I was working with a university and they were putting their students through it. And the students were like, this is amazing. We need this. This And all of a sudden I went, huh. So if we start with the students and we get them to the point where they understand the PESO model and they are PESO model certified, by the time they go into the workforce, they that's what they will expect. And they're the ones that are going to change it. So Laura, I think you're right in that the next generation is going to be the one that changes this for the industry finally. Yeah. Um, because they, you are, you're right. They're hungry. They want, they want to work for organizations that take a stand. They want to work for organizations that have purpose, and they want to know the work that they're doing is directly affecting the goals of the organization. And that's yeah. phenomenal. That's what's going to get us there. Yeah, I think you know they talk about um, like social impact in particular. Um, you know, if they're they're very conscious of mm -hmm. um, you know like planet. Yes. Well, all the PPs really, yeah. people, planet, etc. You, know, they, yeah. they are conscious of that, and I think what we're not, what we're not talking enough about in our industry is that next generation. Because if we look at, you know, we're members of organisations, and um, we might have like groups that are set up. So I'm the chair of the PRC in Scotland. We have a next gen group. Um, but that until until this like recently wasn't really coordinated with what our main group was doing. So um, mm. it's really important that you know I'm there to help set an example and support them. They can take the lead from me as well as being empowered to go and do some good work. Right. And I think that is we we need to make them feel that they're empowered to do it at the yeah, same absolutely. time as teaching them. Absolutely. Yeah. Yeah. Makes a lot of sense. Um, is that a little bit like? We talked about the the, the PR of PR uh, being a little bit um, um, of having a problem. The thing, of course, is and and uh, that really kind of like hit home with me, Laura, that you tell like every PR campaign or project that we do has different type of measurement outcomes, right? It's difficult to be one, and and with marketing, it's kind of often different, right? They they have like easier to understand or at least easier to measure outcomes which is like what's the cost per lead how many leads are you driving like how, yeah. much, how much is a lead wor worth to me is this is is this part of the problem that pr has that, that it's harder to kind of come up with kind of easy to understand measures I, th I, th yeah, I, mean, I, think, I think pr pr practitioners can learn from marketers from that yes. point of view and yes. um, equally if we're going in and talking to boards about the value that we're adding to their businesses, we need to be talking in business terms. So, you know, we we can't we can't just be talking in fluffy terms. You know, vanity metrics are out the window. Um, yes, we can talk about cost per lead, etc. But at the end of the day, the impact of our campaigns or our projects or whatever you want to call them, our strategy. <laughs> 
all of that and the tactical stuff, what is, at the end of the day, what have we done? Have we increased sales? Have we changed perceptions? Have we, you know, what have we actually done? And right. that yeah. is what people find so difficult to talk about, yes. mostly because they don't do the stuff at the start or in the middle for the benchmarking and goal setting, etc. And they try and measure at the end. And I've seen it in countless yes. awards. Ooh, award entries. Oh. <laughs> <laughs> yes we oh, set out to do dear. this we did this and you're like really <laughs> they yeah. get a zero for me if they've not set objectives and they haven't evaluated and they've, they don't have any supporting they just get a absolutely. zero yeah, yeah. absolutely yeah. Yeah. <laughs> there's one question coming in uh maybe Jeannie, you can uh give it a, a look on that uh from the audience can um, you share an example of a measurement you used for a particular goal? Just like one small thing that you kind of put in. Uh, I'm not sure, Jeannie, you can talk a little bit about that. Yeah, um, it's I can speak to this because I just had this conversation this morning. Um, we, for one client, we our, our goal, um, our marketing goal is to build a world-class marketing blog. And I was like, great, what does that mean? And so when we look at what it means to build a world class market, a world class blog, you have to look at it from the perspective of what does it do. So it means that your content shows up first on the first page of Google results for your priority keywords. It means that bloggers and media outlets are linking to your content because it's that good. It means that people are searching for you and coming to the blog and then going through the the, the the lead generation funnel. So they're subscribing to the blog, they're downloading content, they're going into your marketing lead generation, email campaign, nurture campaign, whatever it happens to be. Um, domain authority has increased for your website. Um, what else did I have on there? I had like eight. So th those are just off the top of my head. Those are some mm -hmm. things that will help you build a world-class blog, right? And when you build a world-class blog, it's going to affect all those kinds of things. So your subscribers have, incre have increased for sure. And so mm -hmm. has your readership. It's being shared on social media without you prompting it. Um, you are generating marketing leads. Now the blog itself isn't going to nurture a marketing lead to a marketing qualified lead, but it's going to generate marketing leads. And then you're going to help get them into that funnel from your content, from a content perspective. So that's just one tactic um, that you can use and think about the kinds of things that you can measure. Um, and you notice that we don't say number of social media followers or how many people read it or how many website visitors or anything like that, because mm -hmm. we don't care. We don't care. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Yeah, people are very interested in that. We see on the chat, Jeannie, so you should kind of write about. Uh, this. Maybe I'll do it. <laughs> I'll do it on the, it, yeah, yeah, yeah. I'm pretty sure this will end up somewhere on on the blog, somewhere, I guess. Huh? So that's good. All right, maybe, um, Laura, I'll, I'll I'll ask the same question to you, like because they're, they're like it seems that they want to have like very practical examples. Can you give me like a good example of of a measurement that that you used for a particular goal? Ooh. <laughs> <laughs> um. Pfft. I mean, I, I don't tend to work too much on the execution side of stuff. Mm -hmm. um, I tend to be the one that sets the sort of goals to be measured. Um, however, if I was to give an example, well, I gave an example earlier on about the, yeah. um, you know, getting people to eat more fruit. Um, <laughs> <that> example. <laughs> uh, so, for example, if, if anyone missed it, um, I will tell you again. Um, if your objective is to get a community to eat more fruit, um, for example, because it has been found that, and this is uh, absolutely not founded evidence, I'm just making this up for the purpose of the question. <laughs> um, <laughs> if, for example, it has been known to uh, cure coronavirus and people must eat fruit, then you need to find out, well, okay, so here's the community. Who mm -hmm. are these? Well, what fruit do they currently eat? How much do they eat? How much does it cost? Where do they buy it from? Um, or if they don't buy it, why are they not buying it? All these types of things, the positives, the negatives, anything that can help you A, inform your strategy. But think of the very end when your client says to you or your boss says to you, that work you were doing for the last six months and, and all that money we gave you as a budget, how did that actually make an impact in the community? And you say, 
oh, I don't know. Or you could say, well, actually, we've just done the evaluation and um, we found that um, we have increased um, instead of one in five people eating five pieces of fruit a day, we now have five out of five people eating fruit a day. Um, we have found that they are um, all supporting the local economy through buying from local grocers or from the local growers. Um, and the, the more you and the more questions you ask at the start and at the end to to kind of support your whole um, your whole narrative around your campaign, the more you're going to be able to really measure the impact at the end mm -hmm. of it. Um, and I think that's that's again key to what we've been talking about through this this most of the session. Yeah, you yeah. raised a really good point too. And Jesse, I'm sorry, I'm just going to no, no, go ahead. Um, there's something to be said as well about understanding how the entire organization works because as you're talking about fruit, we had a client and I, I didn't, this was early in my agency days, so I didn't understand how the entire organization worked at that point. And this was a really good lesson for me, but um, they are a really popular fruit stand for lack of a better term in California. There's, and, and people will go to California and get their fruit and bring it home. It's that, that good. Mm -hmm. um, and so they decided they wanted to start selling online and they hired us to help them figure out the e-commerce piece and you know start to communicate it and all those kinds of things. And we did. And people kept going to the website. I mean, it was like all of the goals that we had set were we were reaching them. The one goal we were not was revenue and we couldn't figure out why. And people were dropping at the, the grocery cart, they, at the shopping cart. They, they would go, they would get put everything in the, the shopping cart and then they would leave. And it was because we didn't understand that the shipping costs were twice what the fruit was. <laughs> yeah. And they kept yeah. blaming us. They kept, they kept saying it was our fault and we were, but we were doing everything that we were supposed to have been doing. And when it came, when it finally came out that that's what the problem was, that has nothing to do with communications. It has nothing to do with marketing. It has everything to do with operations, right? That has nothing to do with us, but we didn't understand the full cycle of the business and what they were doing. We also didn't try to buy it ourselves, right? Yeah. So that's how we figured it out is I went to buy it. And I was like, well, holy cow, I'm not paying $70 to have $10 of fruits delivered. So, yeah, yeah. yeah. I think I think all that. The, yeah, because like, if, you know, talking about e-commerce stuff, like one of the first things you'd probably try and figure out is the customer journey. Yes. So like, what, is, what are the touch points when you first come in contact with the brand? When is that? And then when is the last contact with the brand? Yes. And what, what happens in between? Right, right. Yeah. Yes. Um, and I think that, that a lot, a lot of people could think that might be to do with marketing, but then if we're taking ownership in inverted commas of the narrative of what we're doing for campaign and, we're, and one of our goals is to sell, it's in our interest to know yes. <laughs> that <we're being laughs> yes. so that we can measure at the end. Yes. Yes. Whereas, you know, I think a lot of people might try and bat that off and say, oh no, that's nothing to do with us. We don't handle you know, the commerce or we don't handle shipping or operations, but actually that's the very reason that public relations has to be centered in the organization 360 degrees so that it has access to all the leadership team, the ops team, the HR team, every single team, because Absolutely. we are here to manage Absolutely. the relationships, understand the problems, the pain points and try and solve those problems. I think I think that's kind of like one for me one of the, the the biggest lessons when when I hear you guys talk about strategy is that it needs to be everyone in the company or all departments in the company need to be involved to actually have a successful rollout but also get the metrics you need to kind of see that you're actually successful. I think in a lot of cases PR teams are doing the right things but they don't simply don't have access to the data that they need to prove that they're actually doing a great thing. Is there, is, how do you ensure that the people that need to be around the table are actually around the table? Is this something that you learn as you go and once you've proven yourself, Jeannie, or have you specific techniques on doing it? Do you require that before you start kind of onboarding a customer? I mean, <laughs> Laura made the joke earlier at the start of this that she doesn't work with clients that won't let her do the, the strategy. And sure. so we're, we're in a very good place as well, where 
we we won't like we have a list of things that we need and we have a, a very specific process that we work through in order to help our clients get the results that they want if they're not willing to do that stuff we find out pretty early and mm -hmm. it includes little things like you're not willing to give us access to google analytics yeah we can't work with you yeah yeah and and how do you get to such a place where um um like because of course lots of agencies are starting out they don't have kind of the experience how like like do you start with small projects or like next to the the, the stuff that the clients require from you you kind of do the other stuff where you prove yourselves laura how, how do you think um like people just starting out can actually like require that from people that they work with, that they get access to certain departments, people, data. So, um, yeah, I mean, one of the easiest ways is to to take what you can, like small projects or something like that, and 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 you know work hard and and deliver good results. Um, but I think it's really important still, and you know. I, yeah, I think for, you know, if, like for um, not necessarily for like the next generation new starts in PR, but maybe um, new agencies, for example, when they're trying to get you know, their foot in the door to work with clients. I always talk about thinking like an entrepreneur. Mm -hmm. um, yes. and yeah, because, you know, entrepreneurs have a, a sort of bendy brain where they are thinking about the product or service they're testing the market they're thinking about how you can improve it they're then coming back it, you know kind of looking at um like nudge theory um you know kind of adapting to using the sort of data and analytics you've got like that's the whole point because if people if you know if an, um, a prospective client for example um is hesitant about something the whole point is that you have um, if you've if you've got that far, you have the data to be able to prove um, why you should be doing a certain thing in a certain way. Right. If you haven't got to that point yet, and you're just at the stage where you're sort of introducing yourself, then I think you know case studies are really important to be able to demonstrate um, what you've done um, and the integrity that you have as a practitioner. Like we have, you know, people come to us because of our experience, our skills, our expertise, and our reputation. Um, and I think that is a, an important point for small agencies to remember that when they're starting out, it's really important they start to build their own reputation and mm -hmm. do their own PR. Mm -hmm. um, you know, whether it's social media, whether it's blogs, or whether it's podcasts, um, you know, get your own strategy in place to help you reach your own goals as an agency. Yes. Yeah. Go ahead, Jeannie. I was going to say, I have a, a really good friend who runs an agency in Denver, and she started out and she created a very clear niche and that that's what she does. She does not stray from it. They do one specific thing and that's it. And I am telling you, I've watched her over the last three years. She started three years ago. They are the number one agency in that industry because she has stayed true to that. And it's been difficult for her. She's certainly, you know, had new business requests come in where she's been like, oh, it's a lot of money, but she has yeah. not done it. She has stayed true to it. And I think that that's one thing that you can do is carve out something really specific for yourself and say, this is what we do and don't stray from it. It's really challenging. You're going to have weak moments, but if you stick to it, you will build that reputation that Laura is talking about and create an opportunity for people to say they're the best in this segment, in this industry, we want to work with them. And it doesn't take very long. No, yeah, that makes sense. Like we've talked about strategy and uh, then also like a, a little bit uh, about measurement. Like what are kind of in that sphere, what are kind of tools that you can't live without? I think we you've, you've mentioned Google Analytics here. Um, is that is there something else, Laura, that you kind of always use um, to kind of like make sure that you are on top of the metrics, like know what to do next? Like, are there any favorite tools that you can kind of um, vouch for at the for, for the listeners here to kind of see what they can kind of look into as well? Yeah, um, I mean, I use like even just you know uh google drive um right <laughs> yeah. Yeah. That's yes. a simple tool stop sending me a word document <laughs> <laughs> um slack uh trail we mentioned earlier on um you know there's you know obviously there's there's presley um <laughs> 
Um, I use if I'm if I'm doing a basic stuff for like maybe pro bono small charitable kind of local things, then I'll maybe use coverage book to collect um, online stuff, um, social uh, posts, etc. Um, but I think. It, Probably to point people in a in a in the direction of PR Stack, um, which is a project I worked on a number of mm -hmm. years ago, mm -hmm. which Wads had created, um, and actually I think had worked with Fred uh, to develop it. Um, and PRStack.co is the is the domain the URL, um, and it has like maybe slightly outdated some of them, but two over two hundred and fifty tools which have descriptions on how they work, what they do, et cetera, for, you know, people like me have, have written okay. chapters on them. Um, and, you know, there's there's tools in there for everything you can think of. Um, so go and have a look at that. And, um, yeah, you'll, you'll, I'm sure you'll find something that, that you can use for whatever specific problems you're trying to solve or things you're trying to create. Yeah, makes a lot of sense. Jeannie, any favorite tools? I heard you talk a lot about Coast Schedule. <laughs> <laughs> I love co-schedule. <laughs> um, I think if you so, my agency leadership podcast co-host and I have a, have this debate all the time. And he he is I have my favorite tools, but he is right in that my favorite tools may not be your favorite tools. <laughs> um, yeah. So the, the 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 point is that you should find something that works for you because that's that's what you'll use. So I would say an analytics tool. A PR CRM like Presley, um, CoSchedule, which is an editorial calendar. Kind you can kind of use it as a project management tool if you want. Um, mm -hmm. A CRM and a, a regular a marketing automation, and then a CRM. So like Salesforce, HubSpot, Presley, CoSchedule, um, Google Analytics, and Moz were probably probably my six that I use. Mm. Cool, cool, cool. Yeah, makes a lot of sense. So yeah, we're nearing the hour here. So we have a few more interesting questions. There's way too many questions to kind of go through. But let's start with one coming from one of our clients out of Bangkok. Whoa, nice of him to join. How can I convince my clients to create their own media? Um, like th that's kind of a question that, that he um, uh, asked. So maybe uh, Laura, you can give it a go. Yeah, sure. So um, owned media is very much un, you know, it's untapped territory, I think, for, yes. for public relations. Um, we have a huge opportunity because we're owning the narrative, we're owning the content, we're you know seeing where it's going and when it's going, and and we have control over how that's interacted with as well. Um, I would say that if the um, client is saying that the digital newsroom is dry, it's maybe. <laughs> <laughs> it's maybe because the content isn't necessarily of value to the person that's there trying to read it. So if you come back to your customer profiling and knowing your audience, if you know what they love, if you know the things that they like to buy, the brands they associate with, the, you know, you know everything about them, you can start to talk about things that matter to them. And those things that matter to them are what your company should be talking about anyway, because that's how you start to build relationships and have two-way conversations and how people start to realize that actually, yeah, their values are aligned with mine. Yeah, I'd buy from them. Yeah. And that's when you start to see beautiful things happen. <laughs> <laughs> I will add to that. If you're in the US, you're experiencing this right now. If you're in other parts of the world, you're watching with fascination, I'm sure. But, you know, Twitter and Facebook just kicked Trump off of their platforms. Um, all of the web hosting platforms have said no to Parler. Um, so you have, there's this thing going on where we have rented our content to mm -hmm. places that we don't own, that we don't control. And Let's just say that your business is Trump and Facebook and Twitter have t taken you down or you have a, a really strong community that exists on a web ho host and the web host goes away. All of your stuff goes away. So there is no reason on earth in 2021 that we are that every organization on earth is not creating their own content that lives on something that they own and control there's no reason for that you absolutely should be doing it is it challenging yes does it take a lot of time yes does it get to the point where sometimes you're like is it worth it for sure 
but it is worth it. It's the only thing that you control. The only thing you control the messaging, you control the customer journey, you control all of it. You yeah. can use other outposts to distribute and to promote, but you have to have owned content. You have to. It's the same with data from like um, email addresses, for example. You know, all these people that are on like social channels, if all the social channels disappear tomorrow, yes. you're left with no names or email addresses. How are you going to speak to people? <laughs> yes. Yes. Yeah. Yeah, it makes so much sense. Uh, really good points here. Um, one more question we have time for, and this is coming from Silvana. A lot of prospects clients still don't want to pay agencies for concepts. How do you handle these pro prospects? I know you're going to say, well, we don't take them as clients. <laughs> but uh, like, how, how, can you help, yeah, how can you help Silvana tackle this issue? Maybe Jeannie, you give this a go? This is what we do. <clears throat> We have a two-day strategy session. It used to be in person. It's no longer in person. It's now virtual. Mm -hmm. um, and we've actually split it up so that it's no longer two days because you can't you can't ask people to sit in front of Zoom for eight hours a day. You just can't do it. Um, no. But the point is that that is what we do. And we say to prospects, this is how we work. We have a two-day strategy session. This is how much it costs. This is what you, what's, what's included, and this is what you get at the end. And what that allows us to do is a couple of things. Number one, it gets us into the organization really fast, and it gives us opportunity to build relationships with the leadership team fast. It gets them some results really quickly. They get a deliverable at the end of that. So it's usually about two weeks after they've signed a contract with us, a month tops. Mm -hmm. um, it allows us to develop the concepts, but we do it with them. It helps us understand what data is available and what their goals are. It helps us understand the whole cycle of the organization and it helps us build the strategy. It also helps us decide if this is a client we want longer term. And because it's a project versus an annual retainer, it's a lot easier for a prospect mm -hmm. to say yes to immediately. And then we can sit in those meetings and determine, okay, how is this going to work? What is the plan? What else is going on? What are your goals? What, how can we affect those goals? And what's the strategic process to be able to do that? And then at the end, they get a plan. And either we walk away and say good luck or we execute it for them. All right. Whoa, this was amazing. I think we have like enough things. And I just went through, I think, one third of my questions for around <laughs> two or around three someday. So um, is there anything, Laura, that you want to plug, mention? Where can people find you if they want to learn more or get in touch with you? Um, OK, so firstly, thanks for having me. <laughs> thanks for ah. tuning in. <laughs> Um, uh, yeah, you can find me personally on Twitter, Instagram, etc. at Laura from Aura. Uh, my business is Aura PR, but I also founded the PR community PR Fest, um, which we're going to be doing some really amazing stuff with this year because there's a new steering group from people around the world um, and new things happening, which is fab. Mm -hmm. um, I'm really open to speaking to new people and connecting with people and and you know seeing how I can help people essentially. So please do come say hi. Um be great to hear from you. Yeah, we will definitely put in the links in the follow-up email. Ginny, where can people find you if they want to learn more or anything else you have to plug? In my home with my intern. <laughs> 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 um Thank you for me as well. And thank you for being the matchmaker to me and Laura. Because like I said, we've been friends online forever and we keep crossing paths, but we've never actually spoken. So thank you for that. Um, and it's been really fun to see where everybody's from around the world here. This is yeah. amazing. Yeah. Super amazing. Spinsucks.com yeah. is the easiest place to find me. Everything's there. Okay, very good. So you guys were awesome to join us today. And as, as is our tradition, we'll be sending you some Belgium gifts and uh, as a small token of our appreciation for you. So something will be coming in the mail. So and for our audience that has been listening and listening with great numbers, as always, our amazing Kate will follow up with the biggest learnings, a recording of the live stream in an email somewhere tomorrow. She'll put in all the links that we've shared and heard today so you can just easily digest all bits of information that you had. We hope to see you soon in the next time and we'll keep you posted on that. Thanks again to Laura and Jeannie. You guys really were amazing. And see you next time. Bye-bye. Thank you. Thanks. Bye. Bye.